Yisroel, Omerim Shema Yisroel. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation. And it shall be a statute forever in your generations. The Eternal Light. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light. This program is brought to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today's broadcast is the third in a special series of four programs presenting the most popular Eternal Light scripts written by Morton Wishengrad. You will hear a repeat performance of Lillian Wald, starring the distinguished actress Jane Cowell as Lillian Wald. This is the story of a nurse. It is also the story of a word, the Hebrew word, which stands equally with truth and equally with justice. The word, doko, charity. It is a story of how in the month of March, 1893, there came to the Lower East Side of New York City to the crowded tenements and the swarming immigrants, the doko of Lillian Wall. Can you tell me where I can find... Ma, throw me down a piece of bread and butter right away, Ma. Oh, little boy. All I want to know... My is... name's Special Lester. Oh, how do you do? Mine's Lillian Wald. Can you tell me Did where... Did you hear me, Ma? Throw me down a piece of bread and butter. My friend, Vasilevsky, will you please direct me to number 13 Essex Street? Holy cat lady, there's a fight down the corner. Hey, Ma, never mind a piece of bread and butter. I'm busy. But please, little boy, I'm a nurse. Just tell me... Sock him, where... pony, sock him. But number 13 Essex Do me a favor, no, he's hold something for me. Oh, my friend Vasilevsky, number 13 Essex Run a corner past the saloon, you can't miss it. Hold this for me, Noyce. Well, yeah, what is it? Little boy. Oh, Vasilevsky, what did you give me? Hold it careful, lady, it's me glass eye. If there be among you a needy man, one of thy brethren, thou shalt surely open thy hand unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Introduction to Life On a day in March, 1893, Lillian Wall climbed five dingy flights of stairs to assist a woman in the delivery of her ninth child. Lillian Wall climbed down those five flights and did not know it, but something had touched her forehead. Okay, Wald. Say it again, but say it slowly. There's nothing to say, Brewster. Tenements, bed clothing airing in the windows, uncovered garbage cans, children fighting in the streets, push carts, people, millions of people, sick and dying, and so used to darkness they blink in the sunlight. So that's where you're going? That's where, Brewster. And naturally, Lillian Wall knows what she's doing. No. No, I don't, Brewster. That's good. I hate people who are sure. Why don't you stay at the college? You and me? Well, we're going to be a couple of the finest lady doctors New York ever saw. But I've already told the dean that I've quit. 
Well, if we can't be lady doctors, we're still a couple of middling fair graduate nurses, aren't we? Oh, Brewster, you're not... I am. If you're going to live down in the Lower East Side, so is friend Brewster. Oh, my dear. Oh, you don't know what you're in for. Miss Wald, Elder Brewster of the Mayflower was my ancestor. Stubborn people, these Brewsters. Oh, no, we can't laugh about it. We mustn't. I was there one day, just one day... Brewster, did you ever hear the cry of a hungry child? Did you ever see a father trembling because he was half-starved? Because he had to give his food to his children? Well, I saw it. I delivered a baby in a tenement room where ten people sleep at night. I saw the furniture they were breaking up for firewood. I didn't know it was as bad as that. It's bad. Yes. Yes, it's bad. And it's wonderful. Oh, my dear, the clothes they wore were thin and patched. There wasn't a chair to sit on, but the rotten wood of the floor was scrubbed clean. The clean, rotten floors of the hungry tenements. Brewster, that's why I'm going. All day, nurse. Like that, he cries all day. Well, Mrs. Mendelssohn, his temperature is 105 degrees. I boiled the water to drink, like you tell me. I brought some alcohol. Rub him down with that every hour. Yes, yes, I rub him down. At nighttime, when he sleeps, I bend over my ear to his mouth. He sleeps so still, nurse, so terrible still. Mrs. Mendelssohn... Miss Brewster and I are only nurses. Your baby needs a doctor. Yes, nurse. What's wrong, Mrs. Mendelssohn? Ten dollars a month, nurse. That's what my man brings in. Six dollars fifty cents is for rent. Three dollars fifty cents is for the table. Well, but I know a fine doctor. And don't worry about the money. No, no, Miss Wald. Not my baby. Oh, but he's a famous specialist, Mrs. Mendelssohn. No, Miss Wald. If you say he must be fine, doctor. But many babies he sees, yes? So many babies? This one to the fine doctor. This one will be only a number. A nurse, he is my baby. Well, all right. Give him the medicine I'm leaving. If he spits up the powder, give it to him again. You will come tomorrow? Yes, every day. Oh, God bless you. Miss Wald... The people here, all, all the people, to you and Miss Brewster, we have the feeling... I'm an ignorant woman. I can't say the word's good. But the way we feel to you, Miss Wald, it is not something a person can take away in his pocket. The children bake in the kitchen, like you say, Miss Wald. Yeah, that's good, Mr. Brobitsky. Miss Wald, a fine lady like you should not have to do this thing. Just hand me her hairbrush, would you please? And I'm afraid I'll need some more warm water in the basin. Not for you to do, Miss Wald. Oh, sit with your children, Mr. Brobitsky. You see, I do not even cry. Who am I that I should cry? Am I the only one? Please. You will let me stay. Mm-hmm. All right. So many times you came. We never thanked you. Um, her comb, please. Yes. You have put curtains up in this room. It's nice. Yes, Miss Wald. It's nice. And the basin of water, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Babisky. Her hair is brushed. And she'll be clean soon. Mes mitzvah. Is that Hebrew? Yes, the words are Hebrew. When I was a girl, I learned some Hebrew words. I wish I could remember. Some people remember words, but you do not forget the meaning of the words. In a few minutes, you can call the children. They will see their mother clean, her hair combed. Yes, that's good, isn't it? Yes, it's good. For the last time, they will see her. And because of you, they will remember her clean. It's very good. (laughs) 
Hey, Marge, throw me down a piece of bread and butter. Hello, nice. Oh, good morning, Zoslevsky. Hey, don't you have a first name? Nah. Oh, of course you have. Hey, Marge, throw out two pieces, one for nice. Hey, Marge, for her with chicken fat. <laughs> no, thanks. Oh, that's all right. Since you came on reps at six times in paper, I'm learning sanitation. <laughs> Well, how does your new eye feel? Oh, better than the old one. I like the color better. Next week I'm getting a job. I'll pay you back. Oh, Vashilevsky, you're too little to work. On Hester Street, nobody's too little to work. It's a very fine day, eh, Miss Wall? Day, Vashilevsky. Oh, good morning, Mr. Colucci. Vashilevsky, say good morning to the street cleaner. Come on. Hi, Colucci. has business picking up. Oh, Vashilevsky. <laughs> hey, sock him, Tony. Sock him again, Tony. <laughs> Here, noise. Hold me eye. Leave a little for me, Tony. Sock him, kid. Leave a little for me. <laughs> Oh, you mustn't mind him, Mr. Gallucci. <laughs> him? He gonna fight with my boy. Tony's the mine. Mm -hmm. They fight together. Good boy. <laughs> oh, I wish there was a place where they could play instead of street fighting. Ah, uh, sure. Here, many things are bad. Terrible. In Italy, nurse, they say, Gallucci, where you go? To promise the land, I say. Yes. Yes, I know. See, si. I'm a Gallucci. Street cleaner. In Italy, me, Golucci, I read Dante. Here I find Dante, l'inferno. Per me si va nella città dolente. Per me si va nell'eterno dolore. Per me si va tra la perduta gente. Sì, si, signorina, la perduta gente. Lost people. Tenement, signorina, no air, no light. Live like animals. Filthy, dirty bambini, they die. L'inferno. Excuse, signorina. Better Colucci stop the talk. Better to take the broom and sweep up. Better to take the broom and sweep up. The Lower East Side, 1895. And it's Dutka of William Wall. It's Dutka, the word charity, derived from the word tzedek, justice and righteousness. And the charity of Lillian Wall, even as the righteousness of Isaiah. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. For Lillian Wall, there was only the immediate task. And Miss Brewster laughed. <laughs> Definition. Lillian Wall is a state of energy surrounded by street cleaner, children with running noses, push cart peddlers, street corner loafers, crying babies, and the affection of the East Side. <laughs> oh, you're tired, Brewster, aren't you? I guess so. Yes, that's what I thought. Look, Brewster, I've got the constitution of a horse. I wake up at all hours, climb stairs. Why, well, I'm getting fat on it. But not you. I know. I hate to quit now. But you have to. Don't you, Brewster? Lillian, what are you going to do? Do you know Jacob Schiff? He's very rich, isn't he? Oh, I saw a house on Henry Street. 265 Henry Street. Maybe with Mr. Schiff and Mrs. John Crosby Brown and Mrs. Solomon Loeb and some others. Maybe I can get that house on Henry Street. And instead of two nurses, ten nurses. Maybe more. Of course. And perhaps a backyard for the children to play in. Why don't you talk to Mr. Schiff? Brewster, where's my hat? <laughs> I'm on my way. <laughs> Mr. Schiff, a million and a half human beings are crowded in an area no bigger than a Kansas farm. There's tuberculosis, typhoid, diphtheria, and every disease in the book. Fires break out every day because of the overcrowding. The death rate is 26 per thousand. You think it's your duty to make it better? Oh, I don't know what duty means. I haven't time for abstractions. I want to do the next thing that has to be done. <laughs> You'll wind up with a settlement house. I want a nursing service, Mr. Schiff. 
The Henry Street Nurses. Yes. Hmm, I like that. But one thing, there must be no labels. Everyone must be helped. Oh, well, there are no labels, Mr. Schiff. There are only people. Lillian Wall, you speak like a Talmudist. That's fine. I'll talk to Mrs. Brown. I think we can manage that house on Henry Street. In 1895, the house on Henry Street was open, and almost from the first day, it was more than a house. Here, Vashilevsky and Tony studied their homework. Here, Mr. Babritsky brought his children to celebrate the Jewish festival of Sukkot. And here, Frederick, the Negro janitor, opened his folding chairs and made a house of worship for his people. Oh, Miss Wall, Mm ma'am, is it all right for me to set up a meeting house here? Well, of course, Frederick. What denomination are you? Not that it makes any difference. Well, ma'am, uh, I'm ecclesiastical and loose. <laughs> we just pray to God, that's all. And I've and I got me a sermon, too. Have you, Frederick? Yes, ma'am. They'll sit in them chairs and I'll stand up. And I'll say, brethren, I'll say, brethren and sisters, this is just a simple church meeting house. But we never would have had it without Miss Wall. But it's ours, and I'm glad to see you all here. Now, uh, I didn't ask the President of the United States to come... For he wouldn't have come. I didn't ask the governor of New York to come. For he wouldn't have come. I didn't ask the mayor to come. For he's busy with other things. But I did ask the Lord to come. And brethren and sisters, he's here. Well, Miss Wall, there's a little boy outside who tells me we've got a flourishing settlement house. (laughs) Yes, that must be Vasilevsky, Mr. Schiff. I asked him to mail a letter for me. He walked two miles and delivered the letter himself. (laughs) Then he licked the stamp off and gave it back to me. (laughs) Well, I expect the people who see you are just ashamed to be anything else but good, Miss Wall. Now, um, what's this trouble you have? The needle workers. What about them? Oh, Mr. Schiff, I know what they earn. They can't support their families. Now they're talking work stoppage. Oh, there's going to be starvation here. That must not happen. Oh, that's why I called you. You you know some of the employers. Bring them here. Let's try to talk it over. Do you know something, Miss Wall? What, Mr. Schiff? I've heard some people say that a settlement house is a place to teach poor people to eat with forks. But uh, you seem to be different. You want to put food on the forks. (laughs) I'll ask a few gentlemen to come, but I don't know that they'll like it. Mr. Cooper, don't you see the problem? Miss Wald, Mr. Schiff asked me to come. I came, now I'm going. Cooper, you don't lose anything by staying and talking to Miss Wall. Chef, you see this watch. Every hour that passes costs me ten dollars. That's more than Mr. Brobisky earns in a week. Yes, well, I don't know the gentleman, Miss Wall. I dare say it's no more than he deserves. Mr. Cooper, hmm? look out of that window. What for? Look out, Mr. Cooper, and tell me what you see. <laughs> Is this a game? <laughs> I see some people. Good. Now look in this mirror. The one above the table. What do you see there? What is this nonsense? What? I see myself, of course. Of course. The window is glass and the mirror is glass. But just because the mirror is covered with a bit of silver, you stop seeing people and see only yourself. Oh, look here. What can I do about it? Business is business. It's a, it's a question of supply and demand. It's a question of people who haven't enough to live on. It's supply and demand, Miss Wall. I pay what the industry pays. Still. Yes? Yeah, I know the men get very little. I'll tell you what I'll do. We're listening, Mr. Cooper. If what I pay them out of my business pocket isn't enough, well, I'll help with relief out of my charity pocket. Mr. Cooper, I've been in homes where people pawn their furniture down to the last stick so they can pay us even five cents for our service. They insist on paying, even a penny, because they don't want charity. Not ours, and not yours. Cooper, our whole world falls apart if we forget certain things. Well, I don't know. No, of course you know. Do I, Schiff? 
The verse in Amos. You read it in English, I read it in Hebrew. My friend Dolan reads it in Latin. But the labels disappear and words mean the same. Will two walk together except they have agreed? Will a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where there is no lure for it? That's what this house means. Two people who walk together and are agreed. Cooper, please think it over. I know you'll change your mind. Happy years for Lillian Wald, seeing beyond the charity of almsgiving into the charity of justice. Now she understood the words of the psalmist. Happy is he that considereth the poor. And this consideration led her through the dingy tenements, past the coughing children playing amid the refuse of the slums, past the squalor of lives ground down by poverty, to the halls of the legislatures. And an American nurse sat modestly in her seat and waited to be heard. Speaking now for the housing measure, Miss Lillian Wald. Miss Wald, have you any additional statistics? No, sir. I don't understand statistics. For every number, read a human being. For every tenement on your list, read a place where people live. Read toilets in the backyard. Read sickness. Oh, let's not talk of mankind or of society. I don't know what they mean. Talk of a boy called Vasilevsky growing up in the gutter. Then, Miss Wall, we want facts, not emotion. You can't squeeze emotion out of fact. Sir, I'm presenting facts. All you've told us it isn't good to be poor. Sir, I'm telling you it's dangerous to be poor. To the poor, yes. To you, sir. In the tenements, consumptive women manufacture cigarettes. They lick the cigarette papers with consumptive lips. You smoke, sir. It seems to me that I'm presenting a fact. And right now, you're suffering from an emotion. (laughs) Oh, gentlemen, I haven't come here to scare you. It's our religious duty to build homes for our people, to give work to our people, to give them decent pay for that work, and the leisure to discover a world that isn't just work and eat and sleep. I... I hope you'll excuse me. I... I I talk too much. Once a very wise speak keener I knew said to me, Salucci talk too much. Better to take the broom and sweep the street. Nice you've done a good job. I'm going to do something for you. Are you? Sure. I'll tell my mother to throw you down a piece of bread and butter. In wax paper. <laughs> no, Vasilevsky. But if you want to do something for me, just tell me your first name. Nah. Please? My mother was a patriot. Well, that's fine. But what did she call you, Vasilevsky? Vasilevsky. No, no, no. Your first name. Don't laugh, no, I saw Almeria. She called me Washington. Well, that's a wonderful name. Yeah? Go ahead, say it. I dare you. Uh, Washington, Washington. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Ah, uh, see what I mean? <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Wall. <laughs> Goodbye, Vasilevsky. <laughs> slums of Lillian Wald are nearly vanished, but the house on Henry Street still stands, and the nurses still go among the remaining tenements of New York and carry to the sick and to the needy the Zdukka of Lillian Wald. Zdukka, the Hebrew word for charity, and the word that is greater than charity, the word righteousness.
now present Mr. Louis M. Loeb of New York City, chairman of the current campaign of the Federation of Jewish Philanthropies. Mr. Loeb. Rarely in these post-war days can one speak of progress without some misgivings. Yet I shall talk of progress, of a true progress which has developed since the days when Lillian Wald dreamed her dreams in the New York slums. The extremes of human misery have been rolled back. In our community, few people starve and none freeze. But the progress I see does not lie in this alone. We have moved forward from the practice of personal charity to the concept of community goodwill. Today, philanthropy is the organized expression of a community. It is not content to stay its hand after bare survival has been had. It presses onward instead to ensure so far as possible the well-being and the dignity of those it serves. To support her work, Lillian Wald appealed to Jacob Schiff and Mrs. Solomon Loeb. In those days, philanthropy was the prerogative of the millionaire. Today, philanthropy is no longer the privilege of the few. Rather, it is the duty of the many. Today, that same call to social responsibility, which Jews hear ringing in the voices of the Old Testament prophets, is answered by Jews throughout the nation by the creation and the support of innumerable community-serving institutions. Those institutions are known to you. You have encountered them in your daily lives. They include hospitals, community centers, child care and guidance agencies, homes for the aged, a great and penetrating network of organizations designed to aid men in the pursuit of happiness and of decent living. We have heard how Lillian Wald struggled for the people of the East Side without the aid of such institutions, of how difficult and often hopeless her task was of how she was led to perceive the absolute need of that organized kindliness which today I have referred to for the proof of progress. Remembering her story, I wonder what Lillian Wall's reaction would be if she could be with us today to see the evidences of the new philanthropy. I can imagine the inspired and wonderful delight which would lighten the face of that noble woman. Certainly she would tell us that we, the Jews of America, have chosen the right way and urge us at all cost to continue in that way. Thank you, Mr. Loeb. Today's story was entitled Lillian Wald, the third in a special series of four programs featuring the most popular Eternal Light scripts written by Morton Wishingrad. Miss Jane Cowell was starred as Lillian Wald. The music was composed by Morris Mamorski and conducted by Milton Catins. Cantor Robert H. Siegel was heard in the liturgical music. And the entire production was under the direction of Frank Papp. This program is a weekly presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations and is brought to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.